Lois, Stas. It's uh, great to see you again. Um, what a year it's been. Um, I'm sure that uh, things are... Um, uh, cheers. From uh, down here in Melbourne, we've survived the uh, longest lockdown in the world. How's things right. in Newcastle? And the good news uh, is Stas masks off for us down here finally. Yeah, congratulations. Um, cheers. Um, yeah, things are slowly getting back to, to normal or COVID normal, as they say. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I know I've been, I've got family down in uh, Victoria and I've lost of friends, obviously, and uh, it's been really, it's been really long and tough um, <laughs> this year for, for you guys, especially. Um, and, you know, it's just a, a testament to every little, uh, every person who do, does their own thing that we, you guys have, now what 33 days with zero cases yeah, um I'm definitely in the 30s i mean i feel for all of our <laughs> bring, uh, brothers and sisters around the world especially those in north america and europe at the moment uh, going through third waves because uh, we had yeah. that little second wave uh, i think it was start of july and we had similar numbers to um france 600 700 um, a day infections and then um, went into a massive hard lockdown um which clearly worked um so hats off to the Victorian government and the health department, everyone. Yeah, and yeah. and all the individuals uh, yeah. who, who actually largely followed the followed, rules. followed the rules and did the right thing. Because you know, it's not just Victorians. It's like you guys were almost doing the hard yards for the the whole Australia. So we we didn't get an outbreak. So, so yeah. anyway. Um, so yeah, cheers. Sir. So yeah, what a year. Um, we're both here having a virtual beer, and I guess that's one of the trends we can talk about in um, uh, 2020 was the rise of um, technology, the Zoom call, the Zoom beers. Did yep. you do some Zoom uh, oh. Zoom clocks and things like that? We did. We did. I'm in a uh, homebrew club, and uh, we only just started going back to physical meetings. Um, yep. Most of them were. Um, were Zoom and you know, yep. we tried to do styles, but you missed that whole, here's a beer I tried, you know, I, I brewed, I tried this, and then you get to share it. It's, it. So we had to choose stuff that everyone could get access to. And, you know, it was, it was good, but it was, it was yeah, mainly virtual beers. It wasn't quite the same yeah. as a homebrew club. I um, did one uh, virtual beer o'clock with um, some mates in a book club and, um, yeah, once I found once the tiles got beyond about four to six people, it was really hard to have a good conversation. And um, so I was like, oh, I don't think I'll be doing Friday night Zoom o'clock, beer o'clocks. And then um, yeah. we, I was lucky enough to get the uh, privilege to get an invite to the Melbourne Brewers uh, Zoom meeting. Oh, yeah. And uh, Derek from Bad Shepherd was on. And that was excellent because Derek mm. gave a talk about Bad Shepherd Brewing Company. And then I gave a little bit of a talk about Beer Co. And everyone was able to punch questions and so I can I can see the value and I think some of the clubs saw a spike in um, returning members, lapsed members, people who were maybe on the Facebook but yeah. and, and following the group but weren't turning up to meetings but uh, yeah. nothing replaces like you said face to face and um, and, and beer judging in, in, in person and tasting each other's beers and giving feedback face yeah. to face. Yeah. Yeah we definitely saw the, the spike in you know at, at attendance meet meeting attendance was much higher certainly initially because people who live an hour away they all of a sudden don't have to travel an hour you don't have to worry about how you're going to get home it's just yep. it's just easy um yeah that's true yeah but yeah you, you miss out on a lot of the the personal mm. and the, the sharing of the craft um yep. aspects or sharing the hobby i guess so and mm. um now you've been working for a while now. Last time we spoke um, at the Newcastle Homebrew Shop, what sort uh -huh. of things happened at the retail end that you saw as a result of the lockdown and COVID nineteen um, impact in, in the shop? Well, um, I probably naively learnt that um, Newcastle has a very high percentage of functioning but dependent alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> when the uh, pubs closed because everyone went absolutely mad and bought up months supply of beer and sp yep. spirits and all that sort of stuff yeah um, and yeah it was we and it was great for the first couple of weeks but then all of a sudden we started not being able to get stock in and then 
what was panic buying became just panic <laughs> yeah. because they go, I want four of these as if we can't have them because we can't get them. And they're like, what do you mean? What am I going to do? It's like, well, you could just not drink beer or, and that was just not on the table, but. I'm Australian. You know, yeah. I think it was, yeah. uh, we were instantly classified as an essential service, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. After being mutiny uh, <laughs> at home. Um, so everyone was able to brew, but yeah, we, we certainly saw similar things to what you saw there, a massive smoke mm. and, you know, uh, I think I wrote a newsletter, Blessed Are the Home Brewers and, and Home Distillers. Um, and um, a lot of people who were already home brewing and distilling, buying, and then a lot of people entering the um, the, yeah. the craft. And, and I think that's a good <clears> thing overall because I think as those people get back to work or being busy, they're probably mm. going to have a greater appreciation for craft brewers and craft distillers and support them um, yeah. more. Yeah. Um, the other one that was interesting was, I think you and I might have chatted about this. Um, how many people rang you up chasing yeast uh, because oh. they were baking at home? Yeah, and then all of a <laughs> sudden the super supermarkets ran out, and then that's it. Yeah, they just went yeah. looking for yeast. And the other one was um, sugar because yes. the supermarkets put the two kilo limit, and everyone's like, ah. some people were just um, supermarket hopping and buying two kilos here, two kilos here, and then we're like, well, we've got. 25 kilo sacks and they're like that's oh that's funny that's um, funny yeah but, yeah Rays did race a bit yeah and i look i mean we, we we do some trade as well with craft brewers and craft distillers mm. and um it was like a double handbrake at the start i think and then the craft brewers slowly started um going again but talking to a couple of them i heard them saying you know um we went from packaging big cans like 50 litre kegs to a lot of little yeah. cans and selling more beer to more people whether they were doing home drops um or uh direct to drinker online sales but that meant a lot of work for some of the smaller craft brewers you know just canning yeah. every day lots and lots of cans and um uh, that, really I mean, that was, their pups. Mm. yeah and I, I think certainly we sort of had to do that adapt quickly and there was a lot more staff hours because we didn't necessarily that wasn't how we were set up to do business it was all about you come into the shop and then we were like well actually no there's a lot of vulnerable people so yeah. we're going to offer some free delivery in the local area you stay oh, home right. you tell us what you want uh, but yeah that meant that we were really inefficient early on and us, I'm guessing that a lot of the craft brewers were like oh god we now need to sell cans and um, how do we do this and they needed to sort of scramble just so they didn't have you know stale beer going out in cans um, we, um, we were sort of fortunate in that regard because we already had some good logistics partners with um, yeah. Ozpost <clears throat> and Toll but one thing that you know we had, there was a Toll was cyber attacked uh, February before the um, lockdown and then um, in May um, which is not uncommon for a the cyber attackers to come back a second time and yeah. um then post was amazing they would pick up all the post and send some of it as far away as sydney and brisbane to sort it because their yeah, melbourne right. sort centers were so packed well, and then yeah. fly it back so um I, i'll take my hat off to the posties they actually did a good job i know people love to get up Oz post but um yeah. we've found them to be you know pretty stellar throughout it all um and um the other one that was interesting some of our craft distilling customers talking to them went from making spirits to hand sanitizer um, yep. and then that that was sort of like a, a bubble that burst but um interesting visiting one um in victoria last week and uh, they're now making like i guess you would call them craft hand sanitizers so using aromatic oh, yeah. oils the heads from a gin distillation and adding them in and um our local coffee shop um, I notice now they've got this beautiful native botanicals hand sanitizer oh, sort of cool. gone from the, um, you know, cheap and cheerful um, yeah. made in China imported ones to, you know, yeah. beautiful handcrafted ones. So um, maybe the trend will be, yes, people have discovered hand sanitizer, um, whether people will continue mm. to use it ongoing, perhaps not at the level we did in COVID, but um, yeah. I think it's still a, something that people are going to carry a small bottle with them. Exactly. For those and, 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 people are, and people are just going to think after they've been at the dog park and they go to get their cafe lattes or whatever, they'll rub some hand sanitizer on um, at the coffee shop um, or even if it's takeaway. So there's probably a yeah. new market that's open for craft distillers there. Yeah. And what does yeah. back to COVID new normal look like um, up in Newcastle now? Uh, 
Newcastle's getting like uh, about a week ago. The restrictions let even more people congregate. Um, we've got you know some shows Friday. and. Yep. Let me turn that off. <laughs> That was a beginner's mistake, wasn't it? 101. Sorry about that, Stas. <laughs> All good. Um, I've muted it now. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah, we're starting to have some, you know, musical performances and stuff and having restricted numbered gatherings. Um, but, you know, pubs, are, they're still operating. I think it's around 50%, maybe a little bit more. Um, some of the larger ones like uh, the Grain Store in Newcastle, I think they're still running at about half half capacity. But certainly I, I went out uh, last night and I didn't feel that um, anxious feeling that I felt a couple of months ago where it was like, oh, there's a lot of people. Ugh. No, that's largely gone, but there's still lots of, you know, hand washing and, you know, increased awareness of hygiene and there's still that awkward do we hug? Do we shake hands? Do we yeah. elbow bump? Do we? That's going my elbow. That uh, yeah. <laughs> he's certainly got a got a good brand on that one. Um, yeah. So it's yeah, it's largely largely back to normal. But I think hopefully some of the good things about like, well, working from home and increased flexibility and stuff continues to be an option on the table for a lot of people who are able to work from home some days a week. I know a lot of people I've been talking to they've really loved having that reduced travel time and the flexibility of their day so yeah what about what about Melbourne how's it feel to oh, be able to get out yeah and... it's interesting I did go out with um, my darling uh, wife on um, the first Saturday night that we were allowed to go out and I must say the atmosphere was very festive and you could just see the the palpable joy on the hospitality staff's faces just to be back behind bars and pouring and, and working um and yeah and bars, restaurants. Not bars. <laughs> yeah that's it yeah yeah bars and uh pubs and and um but one thing i have heard from again talking to some craft brewers with tap rooms is it's still very tricky i think we've now restricted uh moved from one person every four meters to one person every two meters and yeah the big capacity restraints are slowly loosening up um because but one thing that has been amazing and really awesome to see in Melbourne is um, the city council sort of swung around and been really supportive of um, El Fresco dining outside and lots of people building like almost like pallets um, out into the uh, car parks and and, yeah. and and more outdoor seating. So whilst we can have variable weather down here, um, when you get a beautiful day, there's nothing better than um, riding a bike or or, um, mm. or, or or taking the tram and seeing all these people um, sitting outside having a drink or a bite to eat. So, um, yeah. yeah, I hope that those, like say, some of the good things that can can come from this, whether it's El Fresco and, and councils blocking off more land for um, outdoor dining and also, like you said, um, the work-life balance of working from home and, and working in the office. You don't have to always be present in the office to be working, um, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And... Um, what are we talking in terms of beers, Stas? What are you drinking tonight? Uh, I've got a milk stout uh, based on a McKellar's milk stout, which I kind of uh, adjusted. And then in the <laughs> this is like the beer that almost wasn't um, because I left it mashing and I came back and my grandfather had died and the, the controller just it was off. And I was like, oh, I have no idea how long this has been sitting like this. It was it was about an hour and a half. Well, it was about an hour, and I don't know if it was like it died after the first ten minutes or only five yeah. minutes ago. And so I had to like do a MacGyver to get it, put it in my HLT, and continue the boil, and basically did a no chill into my keg and threw the keg in the pool, and just to try and chill it down. So it's a little bit more bitter um, than uh, than I intended, but it's still you know, very drinkable great thing is too isn't it you're having a stout and we're heading into summer and um, a lot of people think oh, I can only have a dark beer in the winter but I've always thought that stout is one of the more drinkable styles and sessionable styles you know yeah. and, and, and there's still a nice beer in the summer so yeah I'm, I'm enjoying a code pilsner so it's um, one of our better selling um, all grain recipe kits and it's 95% mm -hmm. um, Australian 
malt, you're at Pilsen malt, and 5% yeah. crisp dextrin, and Enigma hops, so an all Aussie beer, oh, nice. um, supporting our local growers, because, you know, the barley exports stopped to China, so we've got to do what we can to help our local growers. Mm. Mm. And, um, in That'd terms be a bit more like a, like a New Zealand pills, wouldn't it? With Enigma? Yeah, it's almost a bit like a New Zealand mm. pills. We're actually um, redoing our New Zealand pills um, recipe kit because we've seen a little bit more Mochoeka and Nelson Savin in the market um, lately, which is really nice. Um, yeah. Um, rework is still hard is hard to get, but um, and <coughs> just thinking about a maybe a tri hop uh, pills now with Mochoeka, Nelson, and Lady, which is a lovely hop. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah, but um, did have you seen up there the haze craze continue to roll on? Oh, certainly, for me personally. <laughs> <laughs> It's been yeah. a been a bit of a ritual. Like every every Friday, I head down to the bottle shop for a mix six pack, and oh, I tell you what, I'd probably be cheaper buying a case. But yeah, um, yeah, just getting right into the deeds stuff and ah uh, yes, um, yep, yep, mountain culture and yeah, yes. it's definitely lots of hazies around and yeah, um, definitely hop hop focus. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's been amazing, yeah. isn't it? Like because every mm. year we say, oh, the haze craze will. When will it finish? But it seems to have taken it to a new level this year. Um, mm. And um, the other one that was really interesting saw down here in the winter. I'm not sure if you saw it up there. Um, pastry stout beers. So it was almost like uh, you went to the cake shop. Raspberry chocolate stouts, um, vanilla yeah. coffee, um, maple porters, yeah, or things like that. You know, lots and lots of very desserty beers. Yeah, there was a little bit of that here, not not too much. I wonder if it's just maybe a uh, beer culture that's a little bit. I would probably say it's not as well developed as Melbourne, um, but yeah, there's there's certainly stuff that's sort of simmering under the surface. But it's yeah, it's not. I, I didn't notice a hell of a lot of stuff, okay. mind you. It was in, just like in winter. Was... It, we weren't out anywhere, so. No, that's existed. true. Look, it was probably at its height, I would have said July, August, when it was coldest here. And um, yeah. and I remember going to our um, local independent bottle shop and sitting in the VIN, and he had, like, you know, almost like a whole fridge full of them. And then the following yeah. week, I'd go back, like yourself, you know, pop in on a Friday and get a six-pack or something, and I've mixed things, and the whole fridge had been gone and changed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think, um, talking again to some customers, they were saying, like, they couldn't, keep up with them and you mentioned deeds there i remember talking to, to, to justin that deeds and 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 you know it amazes me just how many different beers they were producing and mm. you know and asking them question is the core range dead but i think that might have been part of the the lockdown effect so people are going to have you know one big strong can and maybe they're going to split it and share it in the house um they're not worried about they're not going somewhere to have a session or they're not going to have a barbecue with yeah. friends but I think as we head into <clears> summer <throat> down here, I'm forecasting, you know, return to pale ales, pilsners, um, light lagers yeah, like cream something, ales. Something yeah. more sessionable. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, what about West Coast IPA? Is that making a comeback? Yeah, uh, I I think it is. I mean, it's like a reaction to the the, the low bitterness neepers, and I think... Yeah. Um, the people who really like IPAs, they do like that real smack in the mouth um, of bitterness, which, yep. you know, it's, you get awesome flavours and aromas from Neepers, but if you, they're quite filling and they don't, they, they become quite sweet if you drink a lot of them because there's not that bitterness to balance them out. Um, <clears throat> so I think West Coast has always been popular with the IPA drinkers. Um, well, as a counterpoint to um, um, Neepers, why am I holding two oranges in a glass? <laughs> and, and and what's this uh, slightly grey liquid, um, which smells well, slightly sulfury, so I do need to oxygen, uh, sorry, car, uh, CO2 scrub it a bit more. Looks like water. It's sparkling. But no, it's not. It's not water. It's alcoholic soda water. It's hard seltzer. Do you think nice. the summer... Um, Stas will be the summer of hard seltzer, the the antithesis, the counterpoint to a hazy, chewy nipa. It it could be. Um, I'm yet to. I mean, I'm not a huge cider drinker. I know there's big cider drinkers. For me, 
I've I've tried seltzers, seltzers, uh, and I've definitely had good seltzers or and not so good seltzers. I think it's another way to draw people into that craft um, drink, um, and certainly when you, we're talking about more sessionables, a bit more social uh, after being isolated for so long, I think there's certainly a, a push to have something that can be enjoyed several of them and nice easy drinking in in the summer over christmas so it could be i know they're huge in america and we were talking about that last year i remember um about i mean it was interesting just before the lockdown i was in sydney talking to a couple of craft brewers up there and they were talking about you know seltzer and they wanted to have something available for the market if it took off and um and then we went into to, to, to lockdown and that, but yeah, six months on, and again, the same bottle shop, I'll use the same bottle shop as an example, the Vin, they have a whole fridge full of seltzers. Um, yeah. And <clears throat> I listened to a podcast, a very good one on the Oz Brews News, and they were talking about yeah. it, and one of the, I think one of the brewers in Western Australia said, it's almost like a different drinker again. So, yeah. and, and the trends from the US, they're saying, you know, it's the um, people who like, um, uh, sparkling waters, lighter styles, um, yeah. uh, focus on lower calories, gluten-free, yeah. slim cans. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's probably not just the domain of the craft breweries. I think you're going to see yeah, um, I, everyone's going to come in, aren't they? The spirits makers, the, you know, yeah, it's, I guess it's a, I guess it's like a beer strength alternative for people who like to drink champagne or so you don't have to just have soda water and lime. You can actually have, the equivalent of a beer in terms of a standard drink. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think it's going to be interesting, there's, but yeah, there's definitely properly fermented seltzers and there's ones that are just, that people have been making just carbonating water and adding ethanol to give the alcohol. And there's a massive difference in flavor between those two. Right. Yeah. So this one here I've got in my glasses swing. So that's our neutral hard um, seltzer base. And I did mm -hmm. flavor it with lemon and lime and then um, went to see what uh, my darling uh, beloved had in the fruit bowl because she's a gin drinker. And, and unfortunately the lemons and limes were gone. So it was just an orange. But yep. um, I think you're going to see people, and I'm predicting this, so I'm going to go out early and say a home brewer, you know, who's often had the soda water tap as the on the kick rater for like say the non-alcoholic option. The, they might brew a seltzer, a neutral seltzer, and then, mm -hmm. um, you know, you could just have a fruit bowl and cut up yeah. fresh pieces of fruit. Choose your own adventure. Be, yeah. Exactly. Choose your own adventure. Or maybe the, <laughs> the, the behind the kegerator is some different bottles of Bigfords. So, you know, a bit like a lemon, lime and bitters, you just get pour some hard seltzer, which is a neutral uh, one. And this one was made from um, extras and we used um, turbo yeast and turbo oh, yeah. carbon and turbo clear. Um, but you learning about this as I'm going and talking to some of our craft brewing customers who've been doing it for a while. Um, it does, you know, you will need to like scrub it with CO2 because it produces quite a lot of sulfur. And like you said, there is yeah. some, some real art to uh, making mm. uh, one of these from if it's a fermented beverage, yeah. And it's and pH and uh, yeast Correct. nutrient is That's super it. important in those from yep. what I've from what yep. I've read. Um, yeah, and I, I, I put in, um, actually, we'll put up in the show notes, this, um, there's a really good article in the Brew Your Own magazine um, yeah. from The Wizard, um, Ashton, and he, um, he he said hard salts are made easy and mentioned exactly what you talked about, and he also mentioned mm. putting a little bit of calcium sulfate in um, yeah. and citric acid, <clears throat> so all about bringing down that um, pH and pH. making it crisp. Yeah, yeah. that's it, that's it, it's, yeah. So, similar thing look, with I, cider, um, cider's super uh, if you have the pH wrong in the cider, it just tastes flabby and awful. But just tweak the pH and all of a sudden it's a totally different drink. And I imagine that because there's very little in it, seltzer would be exactly the same. Um, I mean, I made one salt, um, batch of cider with a friend around the corner <laughs> and we did different apples. And the one I liked the best was... Um, a simple cider basically which was granny smith apple and just soft cider yeast and it was very mm. dry and let's say very crisp and clean um what about um double ipas are they the new ipa have people gone off just the regular ipa if we're going west coast now 
Uh, oh. Or double Again, dry hop. Double dry hop is definitely something I'm seeing more and more. And I guess the NEPA thing is like just basically pushing the envelope. You know, how, how much can we load up these beers with hops to sort of wow drinkers with the flavours that we get? Um, in terms of the trend, because we're seeing like more people be more conscious about carbs and so calories and um, ABV, there's certainly drinkers that go for the higher end beers, but I'm well, equally, at least in the homebrew shop, I'm seeing equally people who are saying, well, how can I make this lower calories and lower um lower ABV so I'm not sure if that's going to be the next thing just because yeah. I know that the health aspect might sort of get in the way of that but certainly the, the hop loading of beers um, you had on one thing there that I had scribbled down as well before we chatted um, Stas and that was the rise <coughs> of no and low alcoholic beverages so yeah. um, you know like even at the, the warehouse there I ordered for um, the crew um, some upflow um, so that on Friday we can have lunch or something and have yeah. uh, 0.5% beer and it tastes like a beer. Um, but, you know, we're all okay to work. It's um, safe driving home yeah. um, because sometimes you just don't want a soft drink at lunch or you want something with some beer flavour. Yeah. They, they don't taste 100% like a regular strength or, I don't know, or like a normal beer. But, um, yeah, I tried another one today. It's... I think it was a session IPA, and it was yeah, a nice okay. alternative to a knockoff beer that didn't make you feel sleepy or, or, or you know, you still feel sharp, you're ready to keep working, or, or you're going to get up the next day and run the kids around or go to work without a headache. Um, so, mm. yeah, I think that's that's an interesting one. Um, what about trends and ingredients? I know we always cover off. Um, what have you seen in terms of the malt side of the business up there? Uh -huh. Well, up with deeds, I mean, they're, they're always... The, the things I'm seeing more in the cans is, like, oats is huge and and flaked and rolled, uh, un, unmalted grains like wheat. We've yep. started going through and getting heaps of requests at the, at the shop for yep. oats and uh, rolled oats and rolled or flaked wheat as well. Yep. Um, and I guess that's probably pushing towards the hazies and yep. the, the, the neepers and... Yep. And maybe even pastry stouts. Um, so, like the just experimenting. I don't know if that's sort of tied in with the make your own, and people are just starting to experiment a little bit more. Or, um, I mean, it's or, interesting. We, we we've launched a recipe kit called Double Bounce, which is a oat cream IPA. And oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and I did have one beer. From, <laughs> shouldn't laugh about it from the team in Hop Nation, which was 100% hops. Oh, uh, sorry, oats. Sorry, uh, mm. mirror mirror. And it was oats, oats, and more oats, and then it was even oat milk added. Um, it was maybe a little bit too oaty for me, but I like the way that they were trying to accentuate the point um, of oats. But you're right, it's it's um, malted oats, it's naked oats, rolled oats, all sorts of different oats. Um, and, and similar to what you're seeing, um, we've seen requests for more adjuncts, um, mm. Uh, rolled wheats, flaked wheats, rolled barleys, even rolled triticales. And um, the other one I think this is um, interesting one going into the future is like um, flake maize, you know, it's like yeah. because not only for making, say, a American-style bourbon whiskey, but also a cream ale. And here we yeah. are talking about hazies and IPAs, but there's still a lot of people out there who love a, um, a, a nice, ale. easy drinking yeah. light lager. Yeah, and, and, and maybe with a New World hop, like... You know, Mandarina Bavaria or Halatau Blanc mm. or, or one of the new New Zealand or Australian hops. Something a little bit more delicate after being smashed in the face with Nipahs yeah, and West Coast and IPAs. <laughs> well, if, if we're all going to be camping this summer, then getting out the old campers and the tents and, and, and holidaying at home, nothing better than yeah. a couple of cans of light lager by the, um, by the pool or the river. Um, and what about hops? There's been so many hops launched in the last 12 months, I yeah, can't even yeah. think of them all. Eclipse, yeah. Nectaron, Sabro are the, are the big three yep. that I can think of. Three. And um, Anything that people keep asking for that's been around a while that seems to keep rolling on? Um, we're still getting heaps of the classic American 
hops like the Simcoe's and the Centennials and yep. Cascades, uh, Amarillo, uh, but then Citra and Mosaic are still, you know, popular as ever. Galaxy, of course. Um, but Sabro, we're using an awful lot. We've got, um, you know, a number of recipe kits that we sell that have have those. And, you know, some of the new, elder, like New Zealand stuff still, like Motueka still, we don't sell a lot of it, but it's pretty consistent. Um, but, yeah. And there was a beer brew... Oh, brew one. one, yeah, that brew was. One, um, yeah. We, we didn't get a lot of that, but what we got, what we got, flew out the door. Um, yeah. Pineapples, wasn't it? And I was kind of thinking that with the you mentioned in amongst them all, the El Dorado, it seemed to grow arms and legs again this year. Um, yeah. Again, I think off the back of the hazy, because it seems the hazies, it's all about fruits, isn't it? Um, yeah. And fruity Tropical hops. Fruit. And I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm really interested. I've got the copy of. Um, the latest Brew Your Own magazine about the 10 new hops that are coming to the market next year. I'm interested to read about any that are different to just tropical, fruity mm. and citrus because everything seems to be landing in the market at the same time with the same characteristics. And I'm always yeah. curious to wonder who's driving who here. Is it the drinker driving the brewers or the growers driving the brewers who are driving <coughs> well, the drinkers? Well, the lead time for a, for a new hop variety is like 10 plus years, so I, I doubt it's the... Uh... I doubt it's the current trend in drinking this, but they're, they're just taking a punt. And But, yeah, there's definitely been that tropical fruit. Uh, Sabro's been a little bit out of outlier with the coconut, but that can mm. that can work really well depending on the beers, um, what it's paired with. Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard of a few people yeah. doing like a coconut porter with Sabro. Yeah, be great. Not, yeah. I mean, I, I doubt my main experience is Sabro on its own. It yep. was when a, an XPA, we sell um, fresh fruit kits in the shop right. and they've got a, yep. a Citra one, a Mosaic one, yep. uh, and a Galaxy one, and a Sabro one that's just come out. And the the coconut really punches through in the aroma and the flavour on the Sabro one. And it's really cool because it's the same base recipe, same malts, same IBUs. It's just only using Sabro or only using Mosaic. And it's really a cool way to experience the different hops. But, yeah, it's... But, yeah, it, it, I wonder let's what's going to what, be... Um, the, I think there's a daughter of Sabro coming out next year called Talus. So that'll be interesting okay. to see. Yeah, I mean, I tasted a beer from um, Mr. <coughs> Banks Brewing Company um, and uh, uh, I've got the title of the beer now. It was Yakima something, but um smells mm-hmm. like Yakima. That's right. And it was a double dry hopped, again, hazy um, with Talus. And it was an interesting, um, interesting uh, hop. Um, so I think that one will perhaps get some, get some love mm. next year. Um and uh, yeast, Stas, what sort of trends are we seeing in yeast? I know we spoke about yeast this time last year. Yeah, it's largely the same. Like USO5 is still selling a lot uh, of, of yeah. what we do. And and the um, the English style, like the, the Nottingham and the SO4 is probably yeah. our next sort of thing. But, you know, the Quake... For us, it had a spike. Everyone was curious about it, and that seems to die off a bit. Um, uh, but there was that the Lalam and Voss Yeah, yeah, the Lalam that one takes off one, like yeah. a rocket. I wonder if yeah. we'll see that pick up again, Stas, this summer, because the you know the beauty of Kvaik is it's almost counterintuitive. It's almost like an opposite yeast, isn't it? Um, it'll yeah. brew clean at thirty-five, so you know you don't have to worry about temperature control if you're a new home brewer, um, yeah. or it'll throw some you know. Some, some mandarin and thing at, at a lower 20 sort of degrees. So um, mm. that'll be interesting to see. Yeah, um, that was my first idea for uh, how it could be utilised in the basic homebrew markets. Like, oh, if you don't have temperature control, just use that yeast. But uh, my experience with it, it tends to drop the pH a little lower and so you get a little bit of a sourness to it. And unless you're ready for that, like it may not, it doesn't work in all beer styles. Um, great in pails and um, IPAs, but you sort of need to be a little bit careful as to, or at least know what your expectations are of the yeast. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the uh, the Verdant IPA we got uh, in has uh, just been um, quite popular. Um, 
and we, we've sold a lot of it. The Philly Sours, which came out um, oh, about four months ago, uh, there's been a little bit of interest in that. It's starting to pick up a little bit more now. I think people are starting to, the lighter style be used as it comes in the summer, and it's such an easy use, easy yeast to use to make a sour. Um, they, um, did you make a Berliner with that? Um, and you did a video on that, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. I did. Um, it's a it's a moderate sour. So it doesn't give like I I entered my Berliner Weiss into a competition, and tasting it against true kettle soured Berliner Weisses, it, it wasn't as tart um, and didn't have the crispness. I think the, there's a, uh, it gives off a lot of glycerine, uh, glycerol, sorry. Um, so it's quite a uh, full mouth feel for how sour it is. And so it doesn't have that dryness that's characteristic in a Berliner Weiss. So it was an interesting experiment, but it, it's a cool yeast. Yeah. yeah, very cool. Yeah, look, I think um, hats off to Lalam and this year they've come out. We, we've already spoken mm. about three of their different yeasts, and they seem to be um, coming out with on point um, <coughs> yeasts. Um, so we've covered off malt hops and yeast. I guess we've got to mm. say, what's next? Well, the million dollar question. We, we crystal balls ball gazing out to um, oh. this time, twenty twenty one. What do we see <laughs> in terms of? What are the drinkers last, going to be drinking and what are the brewers going to be brewing with? Last year, when we asked yeah. a similar question, yeah. I don't think if we ever would have said we will spend the entire year at home, either of us would have believed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, fingers all bets are off. <laughs> fingers and toes crossed that um, we don't have another outbreak and um, no. uh, we keep the bugs out and uh, the vaccines work. But, uh, yeah assuming we're in the COVID new normal and, and, and we get through relatively unscathed. I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you, like you alluded to before, there was like a pushback to the more sessionable type of beverages. I mean, I don't think the hazies are going anywhere, um, but more as a balance <clears throat> to that. So um, rather than walking to a pub and having six IPAs on tap, um, there's... More to sort of bring the because I don't know, I'm assuming in Melbourne it's it's the same thing but there's still an awful lot of people who just want a crisp light easy drinking beer that they can have four or five of and not be challenged by and I think to craft that and could be seltzer it could be cream ales it could be pilsners um, yeah I, I think that's going to be a market that grows I, I haven't I mean there's Breweries have been releasing an awful lot of sours, and I think they're still going to continue to grow in popularity. But they're kind of like the opposite end of a Nipah for me. It's like people who like sours go searching for that real sort of acetic acid mouth puckering. I wonder too, is it in Australia, we're probably not seeking out like Lambic style Belgian gooses and, and, oh, and, and that sort of thing. It's more with kettle sours with fruit, isn't it? Um, that again, yeah. you know, the, I think that, you know, that they're going to come up against these guys as well. Um, they're they're and, sort of crushable. And wine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lower pH yeah. in wine. Um, and that's yeah. it, isn't it? The, the, the one thing is for sure is this time next year, the drinkers will probably have more choice. Um, I, I and I won the two. Well, done a just, lot to so sorry you, you go you, know, you go oh, i was just going to say stay at the at the at, at the home making end will we see people making more things so you know i think it's interesting when you read the u.s magazines that uh they're coming out with um first it was mead and and, and then hard cider and then um uh, kombucha making and uh sauerkraut making and kefir making and kimchi <coughs> making and sour bread so it's like you know i think home brewers are more than just brewers they're bakers they're um well they're creative, bird nerds, creative coffee people. nuts yeah. yeah exactly yeah, yeah. And, and i uh, think you know we'll, we'll see more people gravitating to new drinks and that's interesting how do i make that at home yeah and i think because we've had a lot of people who were redirecting funds that they would normally go out to a pub and spend 50 100 bucks a week and they go well i can't do that so i may as well get into brewing and they'll just dive headfirst into a grain father or robo brew or whatever it is 
and they go, okay, I've got time. I want to learn something and I want to create something. And I think that act of going back to raw ingredients and seeing the process makes you kind of appreciate all the breadth of flavors that, and, and styles because you start have to think, okay, what beer am I going to brew or what beverage am I going to make or what, and what's the process? And you have, you kind of forced to do a little bit of research into the various areas. And hopefully that's going to help to when people go out into, you know, breweries and bakeries and all that, they're actually more aware of the different types of, things that they can try that's my uh, that's my hopeful view i mean that would be, yeah. that would I'm, be with you. I, I'm, I'm with you I, don't, I, I think you know the rise of the artisan is clear isn't it it's been um mm. across multiple areas like in melbourne for example in 1970 there was 10 <clears> coffee roasters now there's like 400 plus you know and and, and if we think of brewing in 1970 there might have been two or three breweries and now there's 650 plus craft distilleries have grown, um, cheese makers have grown. And um, yeah, so we've got like these micro producers. And then the other thing, like you said, is the information is there, isn't it? Whether it's, yeah. um, you know, your excellent YouTube channels or or a quick Google, the, the, you still have to read. Um, I think we get a lot of funny questions and we can go through that on our FAQs. Stas, yeah. um, and I'm wondering if people got so lazy they can't even Google things anymore, let alone read the first three articles. But, There's, um, yeah. you know, they're in the groups, the forums, I mean, you could post a question to a Facebook group like Milk the Funk tonight about a, a, a super technical sour question, go to bed, wake up in the morning and you'll have hundreds, well, not hundreds, mm. but you'll have, you know, multiple comments from really clever people on the other side of the world who've been doing this for years, pointing you mm. in the right direction, you know, friends trying to help you that you've never met before. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 yeah hopefully that, that sort of camaraderie continues and it opens people's, uh, I guess, opens people to new flavors to try things. I mean, I, I certainly am someone who, if, if, I haven't tried something that I see in a menu. I'll nine times out of ten, I'll go, "Oh, I'll try that." And even if I don't like it, I prefer to try something I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, um, but yeah, there are, there are certainly a lot of people who've gotten a pretty serious kit, and then you they ask questions. You're like, "Oh." Okay. <laughs> well, maybe you, that's the you thing. You really nowadays. need to do some research. <laughs> is, is that the thing with the um, instant gratification genera generation that we're becoming with the digitization of the world? That, like you said, people will rush out and buy a really cool grandfather setup, and yet What's they've that? never done an extract brew or a mini mash. They've just jumped straight in at the deep end. It's, uh, it's also, yeah, it's also the, uh, I think, because you can follow a tutorial on YouTube and you can do something, you can follow it and you can get a product. It doesn't actually mean that you understand all the things that are going on under the surface. Like, you know, if you were to follow along with a, how to make bread, you don't necessarily understand exactly what's happening with the gluten formation and what happens and why the dough rises. It's just like, oh, do this step and then move on to the next step. And you can apply that same logic to beer brewing or distilling or everything and you, you could follow a recipe or a, a sequence of steps but you kind of as soon as something goes wrong it's like oh I actually don't know what I'm doing and you reach out for help and then people who really who have a good breadth of knowledge they start throwing advice to you and then that person's like oh I have no idea what you're talking about and then they get really confused and yeah, well, that might be a nice segue into our next um, month's um, video, um, you know, frequently asked questions, because it is something we all need to be patient as an experienced home brewers or um, distillers or whatever, that we do share um, our knowledge with those people coming in and take a step yeah. back, like you said, because they don't have that benefit of years of learning and knowledge. So just assuming that they um, understand the fundamentals is, is an assumption or a leap too far. Yeah. Yeah, we we should uh, 
we should move on to that one. <laughs> but do we do we want to finish this one off before we, we before we, we do? do we do, we do. Um, and I just wanted to also wish you and your family a um, a, a merry Christmas and a happy New Year or happy holidays. Um, if we're being uh, non-religious and uh, yeah. not offending any any different religions, but um, hope you and your family have a wonderful uh, break. It's been a bit of a mon- uh, momentous year, Stas. So um, you know, raise a glass and. Um, to family and friends. Yeah, cheers and all the, all the best to you and your family and, and everyone down in the... Uh, well, we used to joke about Sictori, but I, I think that's... You guys yeah, have yeah, gone well, well, gosh, well, yeah. well above that. Well, so we're all, we're, we're, let's, let's just hope that we can have a all-Australia uh, COVID-free um, Christmas and summer. That's it. Um, that's what I'm hoping for and getting back to seeing family and friends and... A little bit of normality, maybe a bit of yes. extra, extra hand washing and care, but that's that's okay. I can live with that. <laughs> Thanks, Stace. Cheers, Dermot.